Uh, my name is Dave Goodwin. I'm the Director of Planning and Economic Development. And welcome back. Um, we've been away for a couple months, so what we're going to do tonight is, is re-engage you all in the process and remind you where we've been. And, and then we're going to talk about where it's going. And then uh, we're going to have some time to engage you in a conversation and, and walk around the room and, and, and hear what you have to say a little bit more. So I'm going to turn it over to Pete Seckler. Uh, with our consultant team. He's with GAI Consultants and part of the AECOM consultant team. Thank you, Dave. Happy New Year. Um, so um, what's going to be really important tonight is after I get done talking, which I will try to do as quickly as possible, um, our team, and I'm going to have them raise their hands and introduce themselves, Vaughn Davies and Jason Bird and Mike Herman and Mike Brown, what we're going to do is um, we, we actually want to... Um, just talk with you individually at the drawings back here. Um, so um, I want to make sure you know that we're right here, and um, that's where we're headed tonight, is a presentation and then hopefully just some good dialogue. Um, let, me, let me sort of tell you, I think the, 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 the idea for, for tonight is to give you a little bit of a status update on where we are. And I recognize there's a bunch of you that, that have been at every meeting and know everything that we've done. Are there folks here that, and I just spoke with um, Robert Stackhouse, so I know Robert wasn't here. Um, are there folks here that were not at our closing night presentation in November when we did our week-long workshop? Okay, a good amount of people. Okay, then maybe this PowerPoint show isn't completely wasted. Um, what, what I want to do is, is I want to I quickly summarize what we've done and sort of the conclusion of that workshop. I'm not going to re-present all of it, but I'm going to quickly kind of summarize what we showed. And then we want to talk about some starter ideas that we had coming out of that work, and then talk about sort of a work plan for this week to really start um, delving into some, some um, design and development opportunities for the waterfront. And that's where I think we want to end up really with some conversation with you um, we'll do a little bit as a, as a large group, but then we'll get to small group kind of one-on-one -on -one stuff. Um, and then we're going to be working all week to, to, do, to do drawings, and I know you all want to see drawings. Um, that's the game plan for this week. Um, first of all, just to sort of quickly go over the schedule, I know that most of you probably already know this, but we're going to be in this room all week. We're going to have sort of an open house session Wednesday from 4 to 7. We did this in the, in the public workshop in November, and I think it was really... Um, really lively and beneficial. I think we, we got to interact with a lot of folks on a lot of different levels that um, was very helpful to us. Um, and then Thursday night from 6.30 to 8, we're going to give a presentation and it's going to have a lot of design ideas in it. Um, and we're going to continue to push the ball forward on our work. Um, the way our work is structured, and I hope most of you have seen this graphic, um, but we, we spent our time in the fall really trying to understand how folks feel about the waterfront and where we should be focusing our efforts. What are the major topics? And what we did in the November workshop was to try to take all of that input and characterize it in terms of five dimensions of the waterfront. And I'll summarize that for you here in a second. Um, and, and, and start to put some starter ideas and some kind of attitudinal thoughts about those five dimensions out there for, for folks to react to. And I think in general, we got very strong response. There were some things that need to be refined and tweaked. There were a couple of things that maybe we swung and missed on, and that's okay. That's what it's about um, at this stage. We're building the plan together. Um, where I think we're shifting to now is really sort of the, what, what we've referred to sort of as the second half of the project, which is to really sort of take the model that we have and really drill into the design opportunities now in more detail over the next couple of months. And we're kicking that off with this design workshop this week. And then ultimately end up in a place where we have an implementation plan that goes with the vision, if that makes sense. So we want to try to further articulate the vision, start thinking about implementation now, and then really writing the plan and working very hard on the implementation action plan um, later in the spring. And then we're headed towards adoption um, end of June, um, first, first of July. And also, for those of you who have been following the PEER project, um, we have shared some of the conclusions that we got from the first half of the work with the peer committee, and we're now starting to, to sort of talk back and forth about how maybe some high-level 
aspirations for the waterfront that's coming out of our, our, our process, how that can maybe inform the more detailed types of evaluations that are going on specifically with the pier, just so you know that's going on. Um, so the model that we shared last time, has everyone seen this and seen these five major themes? Is this new? This is new. Okay. So, so what we did last time, last November, was we took hundreds and hundreds of pieces of input and we said, you know, we've heard a lot of really um, insightful, thoughtful, helpful comments and we need to have a model where all of that input has a home so that nothing gets lost and there's a place to put everything so that we can come back to it and continue to address it and continue to flush out what we think it means. And so the model that we developed, we called Dimensions of the Waterfront, and it's really five broad categories of topics. It's stewardship of the environment and this, the relationship between the city and the natural environment that supports the city. Um, it's the experience of the water for boaters and non-boaters. It's having an active park system that strikes the right balance between um, um, uh, the, the sort of sense of pastoral green space and open views that you have now with some of the stresses and needs that, that really an emergent um, set of folks in the city have in terms of recreation, whether it's young kids or, or folks that want to play bocce, you know, and everybody in between, right? Um, having economically vibrant places in your downtown. You know, everything from, you know, are there small business kiosk opportunities and startups to you know, what, what do we do with some of the really critical properties that we have in our downtown and how do those dialogue with the waterfront? Um, and then finally, how do you get around? You know, a whole set of things about circulation and parking. So it felt like everything that we had heard really had a home within this structure. And we got really pretty positive support from this way of thinking about it um, to start hanging our ideas off of and hanging our recommendations off of as we proceed with the plan. So November, was really about that. The other thing that we kind of shared in November was to say, how do you sort of begin to characterize small interventions, light touch types of things with, you know, sort of dramatic, uh, you know, um, bold transformational types of ideas? You know, where's, is there a place in the plan for, you know, we should have more comfortable benches or we should have places to facilitate community art can you put that, how do, how do you put that next to the peer project, right? So we said there are a set of things that are really sort of baseline enhancements, things that are necessary in a very light touch sort of way to make sure that going forward that we um, have ensured just basic community values about public open space in St. Petersburg. And then, and then we start to look at places where we might have targeted enhancements to solve a specific need or a specific opportunity that's been identified. And then there are a handful of places where we could do something potentially really transformational. And so we're starting to kind of sort and think about actions kind of in that way. Does that make sense? Follow that? Um, um, I, I can't really see your eyes very well because of the light is, you know. So, um, so, so what we did then in November was, was we, we presented this and we said, you know, do, do, do the five dimensions work? Do we miss anything? And let's talk about sort of outcomes. And we got, we got good validation on the dimensions, good input on the outcomes. Um, we did our open house. And then, and then um, at the end of the week, we actually presented a whole set of starter ideas. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through those again tonight. And um, I think the work plan for this week is to take, take some of those starter ideas and continue to push forward into more detailed drawings and detailed thoughts. Um, a couple thoughts. One is that we, we laid this... Uh, sort of philosophical idea on the table that we are all connected by water and that we want this 50 year, you know, 25, 50, 70 year plan, long range plan to really be a national model for thinking about the relationship between cities and, and, and water and the natural environment. Um, we also recognize that we have a whole set of things here that are highly interconnected. You know, the, 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 the economic potential of the area is connected to the cultural, um, diversity of the area, which is connected to the environmental viability of the area, which is connected to, you know, stable neighborhoods and, and your, your downtown um, educational institutions and so forth and so on. All these things interlink and affect each other. And so we want folks to think of all five dimensions, whether that's really their issue or not. Because I think when we, when we think about being a good steward of the waterfront, 
over the next 50 years, we have to recognize the interconnectivity of these things. And although all of us are really, I think, biased towards maybe focusing on the one or two things that are most important to us, um, we have to recognize that, that we're part of a larger system. And one of the things we want to come out of this project with is a broader understanding on the part of everybody about what that full tapestry of issues really is. That, that a certain issue that a certain group may have can't necessarily just be dismissed because it's not my issue, so to speak. So this is an important, I think, idea for us, and it's going to start to come out when we start showing um, more design ideas. So um, as I said, we, we, uh, we did come up with some starter thoughts, um, and they're in the back of the room. Um, they're very, they were very preliminary, just as a way to sort of put some ideas out there. And I'm going to walk through that now and then talk about a work plan for this week to push forward with, um, with the thoughts. So stewardship of the environment really had kind of two parts. One had to do with the ecology of the city, maintaining water quality, not having floating debris in the bay, um, thinking about stormwater outfalls, maintaining the basins. The other had to do with continuing to protect the city from um, the natural environment, from wave action, from storm action. So one has to do with resiliency and the other has to do with ecology. So we started working, and this, this is going to be the stripped down version here. I'm going to start going pretty quickly through these slides. Um, but we started talking about um, how we are affecting the quality of the bay by what we do upstream. Um, and we talked about the size of the watersheds that go into these bays and what we can start to do in terms of um, programs to continue to work on what the techniques are to ensure that we've got the cleanest possible water coming into the bay, we're dealing with debris, and there are things that we can do at the point of discharge, and there's programmatic and, and policy and best practices things that can be happening up here. So we want to work on that. We also want to work on the way that we are protecting the basins, the boating community, and really the edge of the city from, from uh, the natural environment. And so we started to talk about, you know, what can we do to diffuse velocity and energy wave action? What are the techniques available to us to deal with water and, and wave action and, and um, some of the damage that you see here? So we had a starter idea, and it said that in addition to the conventional sort of um, seawall kind of breakwater techniques that you have, it might be worthwhile um, when you're ready to really start acting on that particular topic to actually think about other types of um, solutions that include environmental ideas. So opportunities to have living breakwaters in some locations of your waterfront that can actually provide other benefits that may include environmental enhancement, it could include recreational boating, it could include you know, protected areas here that you can really explore um, as opposed to sort of just the conventional treatments which we've, which we've seen. I think the mission here is to try to create a waterfront that protects the basins and provides new opportunities for the boating community while hopefully doing some environmentally um, positive things um, for the areas close, close to the, close to the seawall. So we're going to continue to study that. Um, we're going to look at some conventional solutions for some specific issues. And we're also going to continue to look at these kind of subtle, kind of living breakwater types of ideas as opportunities that could potentially provide habitat while diffusing wave action and storm surge. Um, so work plan for the week, I think, comes down to we want to continue to push forward on the environmental enhancement, water quality types of things we can do. I think we want to identify some areas for habitat enhancement, and I think we want to clarify areas that really require consideration for wave or storm protection and, and go a little bit deeper into describing what possible approaches might be between conventional approaches and maybe some new types of ideas that could be incorporated in your thinking when you're ready to work on the basins, for instance. Um, in terms of enhancing the experience of the water, um, this has to do with boating and marina enhancement, basin protection, transient dockage, possibly a ferry opportunity, um, having a strong, viable boating and marine support services industry, um, but also getting into things that provide access to the water for recreational users who may not even own a boat. Um, how do you just put your feet in the water? How do you put your hand in the water? Can you swim in the water? Um, can you rent a kayak? Can you go fishing? Um, so we want to start to think about sort of what is the regional address of St. Petersburg and how do we continue to build and enhance 
St. Petersburg's address within the broader voting community. Um, but then we really want to get down to the sort of the nuts and bolts of, you know, we've got wave deflect or, you know, wave deflection activities going on in here. These are some pretty dynamic basins, particularly the North Basin and then sort of the mouth of the South Basin and then some of the areas around the Deepwater Port. We know that we need to come in and do some things to, to calm that and protect those boats. We also need to look at maybe reconfiguring how slips work, how we think about transient dockage, um, et cetera. So we want to get into that. Um, subject a little deeper and then we want to continue to look for locations specific locations where we can get more access to water's edge and maybe kind of reshuffle the relationship between the car environment and the boat environment such that we could maybe have a little more room than this for an actual people environment so um, this was one of the things that really came out very strong in our um, in our data gathering with the community is that there just aren't enough places. I should say there are, there are more places, I think, than people would like where you cannot get to Water's Edge or Water's Edge has been given over to parking lots or other sorts of non-pedestrian non types of activities. And we want to reclaim those in ways where people can come right to the edge. Um, so we're going to work on those. So I think what that looks, at, looks like is looking at boat slip configurations and, and a little more work on opportunities to sort of enhance how the slips work, how the basins are protected. But we also want to look at locations to start to reclaim a pedestrian green edge and where can we enhance locations or opportunities to touch the water. Um, in terms of the active park system, again, this kind of has two, two components. One is really preserving and enhancing St. Pete's character. It has to do with um, community parks, the baseline treatment, you know, that what, how do you select that bench? Do you put a shade tree next to it? Um, are there ways to really better tell the story of St. Pete's, I think, really rich cultural and arts community um, through the park system? Right now, it's, if you went to the parks, you wouldn't recognize that there's such a dynamic arts community here in town. Are there ways for that to express itself as part of kind of a baseline treatment? And then sort of moving up that pyramid, are there nodes of activity, are there specific locations where we can maybe suggest new and additional program? Um, that program equals things to do. Um, in specific locations where we can actually satisfy some, some unmet needs that we think the community has. Um, and, then, and then sort of the other side of this is how can we continue to position your open space system as, as, a, as a venue to support lots of different types of community activities. And can we actually create new locations for some of those activities? So I think what that looks like is how do you balance this sort of image as a pastoral and open view type of image with the continued desire for people that want to come to the, come to the water's edge and do stuff? Um, so we want to keep working on that. And we want to work on it in a way that, in, that maybe incorporates ideas about creativity and discovery and play maybe in new ways from what um, has been done in the past. We want to think about open space as um, a location that prompts and provides for lots and lots of activities. So we've, we've started to contextualize for folks that we want to think about what does a day at the park look like? What are all the things you can do? How can we, how can we have as many people um, at the waterfront doing as many things as possible as many days of the year? How can we make the waterfront relevant to as many folks as possible and actually connect experiences into an afternoon or, an e or a morning at the park? So it comes down to, you know, everything from, you know, just, you know, where can you be comfortable and maybe doing things in sort of an artful way, places where you can come and have a social or cultural experience, to how do we really build up these nodes that are starting to form now into things that potentially could be really active and really exciting without compromising this general aesthetic, which we know that the community um, is, is um, very, very solidly ingrained in, in a desire to have this green uh, public open view. How do you incorporate new types of program into that? So we're gonna look at you know, some of these kind of, you know, possible facilities that we've heard about, but we're going to think about where they go and how to, how to triangulate things in a way that create little nodes of activity while preserving large areas of green space for pickup play and just passive recreation. Um, we're also going to look at public special event zones. 
um, and sort of how all the different addresses here downtown potentially could be um, better leveraged. You've created this unbelievable success story with all of your downtown events. Um, we recognize that a couple of those locations are doing most of the heavy lifting. So we're looking for ways to help them perform better and also maybe decant some of those events off into other locations within the downtown in a way that can sort of fire all the pistons, if you will, and not have one specific location do all the heavy lifting. So to do that, one of the, one of the sort of philosophical ideas that we put on the table in November was to, was to think um, a little more deeply about sort of what the criteria is for different types of events and how can we sort of pair an event with a location based on some criteria. Um, now, you're obviously already doing this to a degree. It's not like this hasn't been thought about. But I think there may be some things that we can maybe dig a little deeper and, and continue to refine um, how these large events are, are handled and supported. So again, along these lines, we had a couple of starter ideas. Um, I mentioned earlier, you know, just the, the issue with parking on the uplands. And this was something that we heard a lot about. If you look at just the amount of space here that's dedicated to the automobile, um, when we're hearing from people, we want to get to water's edge, we want it to be pedestrian, we want it to be green, we want it to be an active park, whatever. So we want to look at some reallocation ideas, and we want to start to think of property that is so central to the city, such as you know, the Pier Upland, as something that really is a series of linked community events linked experiences that lead you from the mainland to the upland to spa beach to whatever the pier becomes and that the car will be part of that equation but it won't be the driver of that equation we're going to have a series of, of um, experiences as you come from beach drive to whatever this gateway is that pulls you out to however we think about the museum building to possibly um, um, uh, uh, sort of a european sort of plaza piazza kind of space Maybe this is where the water taxi can come in. Maybe this is a place to hold certain types of events. Um, maybe sort of a community park sort of idea here where we think about what a day at the beach really looks like in terms of you know, morning to night and, and everything that you might do during that day. And then how that ultimately pulls you out um, maybe, maybe with a trolley and, and getting out to um, whatever the pier becomes. Um, and we looked at different options for this. You know, we thought you, know, you could organize it in this way or you could organize it in that way. So I think, you know, again, for this week, what we want to do for a work plan is we want to drill into some of these topics a little more. We want to look at articulating some more of the baseline needs. We want to look at some very light touch kind of neighborhood park enhancements to the north and south, leveraging some of the things that we've heard from the community. We want to study some of these nodes a little more. So for instance, the North, the North Vinoy Park, you have the restroom building and the, the volleyball and the aquatic center. And there's, there's a whole series of things there. Is there a way to sort of pull all that together and really, really um, build that up as a, as a park node while then preserving the green spaces to the north? Um, we want to look at things like Bayshore Boulevard and Straub Park. In this, in this drawing, we start to talk about what this gateway is, what what the role of the museum is within the larger park context and what the Bayshore frontage could be like. And maybe there's a way of repositioning or reconfiguring what Bayshore Boulevard is as a venue to really hold events and community celebrations down by the water and further pedestrianize it. We see, we see large, um, you know, sort of, uh, you know, community, whether it's an awareness walk or a run or whatever it is, and folks are, you know, sort of confined to the sidewalk or they're sort of spilling sort of you know, into the street and they're not sure, should I be in the street, should I not be in the street? We think there's ways of, of kind of unifying all this. Um, so we want to study that. We want to study um, Demon's Landing and, um, uh, and Albert Witted Park, which we didn't really look at very much last time. So I think in terms of parks, we want to, we want to kind of delve into these things a little bit more this week. Um, two more to go. Um, vibrant places along the water. So neighborhood character, and then realizing some, some really deep um, economic opportunities within the city over the long haul. So we talked about sort of pulling the value of the waterfront up into the neighborhoods and how do you get to the waterfront. So we want to look at that. We want to look at sort of incremental, small, sort of light touch types of things that could happen when you get down to the waterfront that could have a strong relationship for the neighborhoods. You know, are there, are there some simple things that could happen you know, up in the coffee pot area, for instance, just to make it a little, a little bit more accessible. You know, how do you, can you see the manatees? You know, that sort of thing. Down to, you know, are there places within the Salt Creek where you can, 
you know, get the fish sandwich, you know, is there, right now there's only two places in town where you can sit on the water and have the fish sandwich, and this is one of them. Um, however, we want to continue to position the relationship of the waterfront to the economic success of the downtown, and we think that the real engine is the Bayboro Harbor um, um, sort of campus area, the research that's going on here, the airport, um, the Coast Guard, the marine industries that are going on here. So um, Vaughn developed a, a whole series of diagrams about this area, starting with you know, looking at the Outlang ball field and how that might start to um, reposition as um, sort of a mixed use um, sports venue that is open to the water, um, connecting that to an idea about um, um, a downtown market plaza that might be similar to the plaza that we talked about here at the Pier Uplands. Um, looking at sort of the, the role of this thing as, as something that actually could draw people, you might take the ferry or you might bring a boat and actually go to the theater if we could provide a little bit better facilities. So this area, I think entertainment district is maybe a little bit heavy handed word for it, but I think the notion that there are some venues down here that could be of significant interest to folks from outside the community. And we should really think about sort of how those things work together and how people can access it both from the land side as well as the water side. Um, we talked about, you know, interesting ways of crossing the water and making, you know, making that area around the Outlang ball field and around that market plaza really dynamic and interesting. Um, places for, you know, continuing to house the really successful Saturday morning market that you have. Um, opportunities to sort of enliven some buildings and sort of bring activity, continue to bring activity outdoors. Um, how do we think about green space and people gathering and, and Demons Landing? How do we use that facility? How does that, how does that connect in? So we're trying to connect all these little dots into sort of one story for what each area of town looks like. Um, looking, at, looking at the Salt Creek, we talked about linkages to the harbor. We actually talked about the possibility of actually replacing this building someday as a starter idea, just to expand Pointer Park all the way down um, along the entire frontage of the marina and then facilitate redevelopment on the other side of the street so it's overlooking the park, overlooking the water. Um, may, or may, may, may or may not be a good idea, but it was a starter idea and it seemed like that was a really sort of talking about sort of emphasizing the importance of a connected public park system, a connected public realm. Um, we talked about supporting the marine industries, maintaining Salt Creek, possibly even letting people connect all the way back to Bartlett, um, Bartlett Park um, with a kayak. You know, could you, could you do that if we had um, uh, the Salt Creek properly maintained? So we talked about, you know, sort of what, you know, what that might look like and, and sort of what a continuous green space might be and how it could maybe step down towards um, the harbor. Um, we talked about linkages from the northern, I should say really sort of the, the downtown proper to sort of through this innovation area into the, into the, the neighborhoods to the south. Right now that linkage is, is not well defined. Um, we talked about you know, the Salt Creek area over time could develop into a really, really dynamic working waterfront kind of, kind of environment. And, and you know, anyone who's traveled, these are the kinds of places you wanna go to. This is where the action is, it's a little messy. There's, you know, different ideas about food. There's different ideas about recreation. You know, you're seeing the juxtaposition of, of, of um, sort of tourism with working waterfront in a very exciting way. And we think there's every possibility for that in the Bayboro Harbor Salt Creek area. And then finally, we talked about sort of the deep water port and, and how to maybe think about this as an economic driver um, and think about the long-term development of of what kinds of uses, what kind of boats, whether it's research, whether it's mega yachts, um, how we really put together um, these big economic drivers with the kind of marine research and even museum opportunities that can be happening um, between the different facilities that are here. So we talked about sort of a collaboration zone between all these different entities where we start to think about circulation and, and how, we, how we think about the development of land in a way that benefits all parties and creates a more dynamic and, and economically um, um, exciting area in terms of what all the possibilities are. We don't have any doubt that this is, this is one of the really, really important economic engines for the city going forward. Um, so we've talked about things like, like museums that might celebrate 
the maritime industry and have them right alongside some of the kinds of um, research or large vessel types of things that you could support in that facility. We even talked as a starter idea about, about an aircraft museum to sort of celebrate that um, aspect of the city. So I think going forward, looking at this, I think we want to continue to study this week the places and sort of linkages around the Al Lang Field and the theater. We want to look at some of the edges and, and sort of places around the marine science and port discovery area. We want to look at Pointer Park. We want to look at Salt Creek. Um, and I think there's some park nodes and sort of some ideas about how can we get some small amount of maybe some retail kind of commercial service restaurant kind of things to, to further sort of incorporate into those areas to enliven them. Um, and then finally, um, getting people around. Having a fully connected system that supports heels and wheels and trolleys and, and cars and really links you from one place to another that you can see where you're going and you see the route, you see what the next experience is and that we build towards a fully multimodal system for moving people in our town. So we're thinking about do we have places where you know, we're so successful that we actually need um, a higher level of service to support all the activity? Do we have other areas where we're really sort of bordering on disconnected and we need to get to sort of that basic level of connectivity um, from south to north? Um, can, we, can we, you know, further define and leverage and, and really sort of build up the infrastructure of the trolley system and the understandability of the trolley system and how you come to downtown to park and how far you know you walk when you when you park that you don't always necessarily get to park exactly in front of your destination the the experience is in the trip and if we can have intercept parking that's easily understood and then there's everything from a great walking environment to bike share to ride your own bike to take the trolley to everything else that's really the future of the city in terms of moving people around. So we, we looked at kind of where the parking assets were and, and kind of how the system works today. And we want to continue to study that this week. And the, the point that I made in November, this is, this is a, a really dramatic facility. This is the Dr. Phillips Center in Orlando, um, three or $400 million performing arts center. And not one parking space was built for this thing. And the reason is because it is leveraged into all of the parking assets within downtown. And the city has been working very, very hard on the pedestrian legibility and, and the pedestrian um, sort of culture of the downtown community. And it's worked very, very well. And I think St. Petersburg, um, we always have to support the automobile, but we don't have to always prioritize the automobile. And I think St. Petersburg is moving in that direction. And we want to explore that. So we want to look at, you know, sort of connectivity types of ideas. We want to look at maybe sort of interim kind of fun forms of um, circulation if we're not ready to expand a trolley route, but there could be um, new kind of interesting ways of moving people around. Um, so we want to look at um, this week things like neighborhood traffic calming. We want to look at the sidewalk system. We want to look at some specific locations where we know we need to build up our sidewalk and trail linkages. We want to look at the trolley routes. We want to think a little more about water taxi opportunities and where all those stops might be. And then we want to sort of look at where, sort of if you kind of grid the city, where are the real sort of parking deficit areas that maybe need to be considered. The city's about ready to head into a parking study. And um, that, ultimately that study will look at this in tremendous detail. We want to maybe think about it in, in general terms and look at where we think the, 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 the deficits might be that that study might want to address. Now, to close, that's a lot of stuff. Um, to close, um, we have spent a lot of time in this project talking about these five major dimensions. What we're going to be doing this week is we're going to be actually sort of flipping our focus, not from the abstract sort of ubiquitous dimensions. We're going to be looking more and more at specific places. So you're going to start to see work where we take a specific location, wherever it is, and we try to develop the ideas through each of these five lenses. If you were to do all five of these things at this location, what would you do? And so where we're headed, I think, is to actually look at specific places and think about comfort and environmental character and what the view is and what might happen there. And some of the areas will be very sort of simple types of um, locations where maybe it might be one or two maneuvers that you're trying to think about. There may be other locations where there might be a whole bunch of ideas all going on, and the drawing may be fairly complex. 
um, in terms of the interrelationship between private development and public park and the waterway. So we, our plan for this week is to generate a whole bunch of these kinds of drawings, a little, a little bit more refined than this, but not a whole lot more refined because we're still developing our ideas and um, get reaction from you Thursday night. So if that's the punchline, I think, then uh, we can open it up to uh, maybe a few minutes of discussion and then break out back here in the back of the room. What we want for tonight in an informal way is your input on what we should be drawing, what locations, what types of subjects, what types of things are, are it's important for you that we try to look at this week. We won't be able to look at everything, but we'd like to get your thoughts on, you know, I really want you to look at this spot or this park or this thing. So we have our, we have our draft work plan in those slides, but um, we want input, okay? All right, well, thank you for coming out. We're gonna stay for about another half hour. We're gonna, the, the design team, we're gonna disperse so that you can come to us or go to the drawings and say, I really want you to study this spot right here. just wanted to uh, thank everybody for coming out tonight uh, there's this has been a a great process I think uh, all the feedback I've gotten has been very positive and you know what we're trying to accomplish here we can't do without you all uh, so for those of you who have been religiously coming to these meetings and contributing thank you for those of you whose schedules have only allowed you to 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 get to a few of them thank you too because everybody's input everybody's input is important um, as we've said this is this is our future for the next 50 years and it's so important uh, that we know what you all want to see in your city because this is your city and uh, so I think you are in for a very exciting presentation uh, there are some great ideas that have uh, come out of this process uh, and it's all attributable to you all so uh, thank you again uh, thank you for for participating and keep staying involved. Uh, we have another project uh, that is equally important with the peer that's coming up and so we're going to want you to stay involved in that and to make sure you get out and vote. Uh, but enjoy this presentation tonight. I think you all are going to be uh, blown away by what you see. And uh, so with that, I'm not going to speak too much longer because you got things to see. So thank you all so much. All right, tonight is an exciting and important night. This plan is really beginning to take shape. Uh, the presentation you are about to see is what we think we have heard the community tell us over the last several months in many meetings, workshops, surveys, walking audits, online conversations, and tonight we want to hear from you. Are we getting it right? Are we headed in the right direction? We need to know because the next step is creating the draft master plan. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Pete and Vaughn. Good evening. Thank you for uh, coming back out again. Now, I always have to start in the same place. How many of you have not been to any of our events so far? See, I don't know what to make of that, other than we must be continuing to garner um, lots of conversation, because we keep getting new folks, which is great. So I'm glad you're here. Um, so Vaughn and I are going to kind of go back and forth tonight. Um, uh, the, the plan is to do a quick summary of sort of the history of the project and where we are. Um, then we want to really get straight into the design ideas and just talk directly about the things that are on the wall. Um, uh, we'll quickly touch on what the next couple of steps are in the project, and then we're going to have some group discussion and then we're going to go back to sort of the, the salon kind of open house format so we can talk with folks individually. Um, so we'll have a little bit of group discussion and a little bit of individual discussion. Um, for um, the folks that are, that are just seeing the project for the first time, um, what, what I would want you to, to hopefully take away tonight is that this has been a long process that has been very inclusive and very deliberate, um, trying to really understand the community through the eyes of the 
the folks that live here, work here, are investing here, raising their families here, um, retiring here, visiting here. Um, so we've gone through, we're sort of in a four-step approach to this. One is just understanding what is going on and how people perceive the community and their use of the waterfront. Um, the next step was um, something that we finished right before the holidays, and it involved another big design workshop like this, and that had to do with, with really trying to document what we think we heard people say, and then start to explore a few starter ideas about what we think that might mean in terms of opportunities for the waterfront. Um, now we're really getting into some more detailed thought about, about what the real possibilities for the waterfront are and what types of ideas we could really embed in a long-term master plan. And we will move into an implementation um, uh, strategic phase of the work and it will ultimately go to council for approval at the beginning of the summer. So that's kind of the, the course that we're on. We also have um, opportunities to start to link the things that are coming out of this work to um, the public review that you're going to be undertaking on the peer competition. So we're hoping that these processes can inform each other, and I think there's certainly things that have come out of, of our public involvement work um, where you've given us input that really can be passed to the peer teams. Um, what we've done this week is we have um, spent time developing our ideas, expanding um, our, our framework of five dimensions to the waterfront, um, and we're starting to get some really good public interaction and feedback on our ideas, including, um, what was it, last night? Last night, we had a, a, a pretty significant open house. A, num a whole bunch of people showed up. I don't know what the sign-in sheet was, but we, we got all these sticky tabs and comments. You know, I like this. What about that? Did you think of this? I love this idea here. Can you change that idea there? So we've had a lot of really good iterative feedback. Um, so we're starting to really explore what the detail possibilities are. And, and with that in mind, I'm only going to give sort of a very quick summary of sort of our guiding ideas. And then we're going to launch right into to design thought. Um, one um, is that we've said over and over again um, that, that the community has told us that we are all connected by water. St. Pete is defined by the water. The future of the city um, is integrally linked to its relationship with the waterfront and the natural environment, and that this project needs to result in a national model for waterfront stewardship between city and environment. Um, another really important concept is just to note that there are so many things that happen on the waterfront that are interrelated, and it's very difficult to look at something in isolation because there are so many topics that affect each other, and ultimately the success of moving forward as a community to get things done will require collaboration and respect for different types of issues and topics that, that have to be dealt with collaboratively if you're going to move forward. It's very difficult to do things in isolation. Um, with, any, with any degree of success. So we're hoping that folks really come out of this with a broader understanding of how the whole system works. And um, I think we're doing that. I know I've learned a lot just from interacting with all of you and all the 20 or 30 stakeholder groups that we've met with um, during the process. Um, another important thing I think to carry in your mind is that the, the waterfront is everyone's waterfront. And so we're looking for ways to make the public edge inclusive and relevant for as many people on as many days of the year to do as many different types of recreational um, opportunities as possible. So we really are thinking how can we how can we let this waterfront be something that is relevant and provides value for the entirety of St. Petersburg's population. Um, that's really been guiding our thinking all along. Um, another model that we've had in this is the notion that there are going to be some big ideas and um, we need to recognize opportunities for transformational change and prepare for those opportunities so that you can react appropriately and build the kind of um, really special places that you want to have. But there's also a whole set of just very sort of baseline maintenance and polishing of the gem that can be done over time. And so we need to create a structure where we can be making incremental investments in a manner that preserves and enhances um, the character of the waterfront that we love while positioning for things that are incrementally more dynamic 
in terms of how they can serve the broader community. Um, as we, the reason that that's important is you're going to see a lot of ideas tonight, and some of them are going to be about you know can we have shade next, next to a bench, and others are going to be complete. Can we completely transform this area of our downtown? So we need to recognize that there is a structure um, to how we think about levels of intervention within the waterfront. There's also going to be a structure to how we think about delivering those types of improvements. We'll have, you know, there, there will be one set of partnerships and, and funding sources and mechanisms to put the shade next to the bench. And that may be different from how we deal with um, really substantial opportunities um, in downtown that you'll, you'll see some of those types of ideas tonight. So we are starting to think about the structure for how to respond to those types of things. Does that make sense? So um, to sort of launch into design, the last sort of introductory slide that I'm going to show is, and particularly for the folks that have not been to one of our events, um, the model that we created to, to help us think about all of the input that we've received is what we've called the five dimensions of the waterfront. It has to do with our relationship to the environment, our relationship to um, the boating community and the ability to enjoy and use the water, um, the function of the quality public open space and park system that we have, um, how we create vibrant, economically vibrant downtown places, whether that's a small business or a large development opportunity, and, and ultimately how we're going to connect everything and help people get around and actually access all these things. Um, so this, this has actually been a, a very usable model for us to create a home for, I think, every piece of community input that we've received can somehow fit into this structure and provides a way for us to start to think about about how to respond to what your input has been. Um, what's going to be fundamentally different about this presentation tonight is for the first time we're not going to talk any more about the themes um, in particular. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to flip the discussion and talk about places and we're going to discuss ideas whether it's um, up at the coffee pot through downtown all the way to Lassing and we're going to talk about ideas in the context of if you, if you are committed to the ideas of environmental stewardship, waterfront activity, active parks, economic vitality, and, and um, thoughtful connections, how might you respond to a certain location along the waterfront? So we're going to look at the city now through the context of the words and the guiding principles that we developed in the fall. That's the goal. Make sense? All right, so um, we're going to start at the top and go to the go to the south. We're starting at the coffee pot and going to Lassing, and um, we're going to talk about all things small and and a few things big. Um, and Vaughn and I will go back and forth on this a little bit. It's, it's probably just important to remind everybody these are illustrations of what could be, not saying this is what must be. So exactly, they're one way to look at it, and hopefully there'll be others. Exactly. Um, so the first thing I would say about the coffee pot is it's a beautiful place, and it, you know, we, we would never propose a plan that would fundamentally change any of this. This is one of the great streets and one of the great water frontages in the entire southeast U.S. This is as good as it gets. You know, you have a tree-lined street, you have a wonderful path, you've got boats, you've got places to look out, you have views, you have relatively calm traffic, there's a bicycle lane. Um, this is this is just you know paradise right here in St. Petersburg. Um, there's also some really compelling things that we see when we when we drive around, and I, I know everyone's familiar with the with the Granada um, the Granada Terrace area. But what I would highlight about this that I think becomes important to how we might think about the waterfront is is that I believe that that one of the reasons that this is so memorable and compelling for folks as we go on our neighborhood walks is not just that it's pretty and everything and it's well proportioned, but the fact that it's there as a piece of what we call garden architecture. The fact that this is starting to structure and create a sense of civic identity and presence, I think, is, is something that we can learn from as we look at other parks throughout the city. Um, certainly the, the landing coming down to, um, down to, the, to the bayou, um, the, some even the little fish details. So we start to, you know, it's hard for me to look at 
at this and not think of, you know, is there a basic kit of parts that might be applied to other places? And it doesn't have to be this kit of parts. It could be some other style. But when you see all these elements sort of next to each other, and they're all kind of talking to each other to help create a place and a sense of civic permanence, that seems like that's a pretty impactful thing that we could maybe learn from. So we think about, you know, is there a basic column? Or is there a basic wall? Is there, does that build up into a trellis? Does the trellis include a swing? Um, can we create shade and create little pavilions? Can we think about ways to walk down and touch the water? Um, so I think that, that this is something we sort of tuck away. And, and as we start to look at certain places where maybe the language of what the coffee pot area is starts to break down, you say, well, maybe if we can just pull that language in sort of a, a light touch, you know, I said polishing the gem earlier. We think of how wonderful this area is, and then we say, well, is this, is this really, you know, as far as we can go to conclude this amazing statement of waterfront um, promenade? And I would say, you know, this probably is not, you know, the way you would logically, you know, really want to conclude that statement in terms of sense of place. Um, we see, uh, you know, we see the, the stormwater retention facility, the exposed drainage area. Um, the boat facility is, is kind of worn, and the kayak launch is eroded underneath the boat launch. Um, you know, we see open water here. We see the kind of lonely bench. So I think it, it seems that it would be fairly, a fairly simple thing. So when we talk about light touch, this is the sort of thing that, that has been in our mind, is you might look at this area and you might say, well, you know, here's the bench. The sidewalk is getting pretty narrow. People walk all the way clear to the end, too. Very, unless they're on their bike and they're getting off to the trail, people walk to the end or their walk is not done. I definitely have noticed that. So would you come in and just, and just say, well, you know, gosh, maybe, you know, maybe there's a bike share station here with a couple of basic services, you know, air, whatever you need. And it's maybe under one of those pieces of garden architecture. Maybe the lonely bench can be put under, it could be a, a, a really comfortable little swing that picks up on, the, um, on that garden architecture. Maybe there's some different facilities for a John boat or a kayak here that makes it a little bit easier to get in and out of the water. Um, and maybe we can take that retention pond and instead of treating it like an engineering facility, we can actually plant it as, as part of the environment by using um, native wetland plants that would grow in there and look lush and full and, and sort of conceal the fact that it's actually providing um, a cleaning process before the water goes out. Does that make sense? Anything to add? Good? Okay. Now, there's also a couple of other things that we sort of notice as we look at the coffee pot. Um, it is a little worn in some places, and that kind of gives it some of its charm. Um, but we do notice that, that there are places where the walkway gets, you know, anywhere from five to even four feet. The planters are um, four feet. The, the gravel is sort of getting into the sidewalk. Um, there is a handicap um, ramp right here, but we get into places where the ADA access is not really compliant. Um, um, and we even get into places where, you know, the storm drainage, we're going straight you know, into the water. We've got some really waffled bricks. We've got some very old roadbed here. So we start to say, okay, well, you know, we don't want to touch this or change this. But when you look at it, you think, okay, well, there probably will come a day in the future when the character and charm of the rumbled brick is sort of a traffic calming device, sort of turns into something where the road, the roadbed, you know, which has been there for decades, just needs to be replaced and updated. And when that happens, we have a couple of things that you might consider. Um, one is that you can see how tight this is. We took this photo just the other day, and this, this woman is actually walking through the planter. Um, you see the, the leaves collected here. Um, we think that you could consider going from you have a 24-foot road in places that actually flares out to like about 28 feet, believe it or not. We think you could actually accomplish your traffic calming goal by narrowing the road a little bit to either 11-foot travel lanes or even 10-foot travel lanes. And that would allow you to pick up a little bit of um, real estate that could be put into the promenade and allow this walking path to become a more, what we're trying to try to get to in terms of a design standard of at least eight feet. We really want to be at 10 or 12 as a design standard for the master plan. And then when we do that, we could actually re, we could, 
we could replant trees and we could create rain gardens that would become an environmental feature. We'd have enough room to put a bench in. Right now there's very few benches or any kind of respite along these walks. So it'd be a very subtle way of just sort of, of just sort of updating what that edge is. But not to go in and do it prescriptively, but just sort of wait, you know, when is, when is the correct time to go in and repair the road? And when you do, to sort of think about, think about this in maybe a little different way. Fair enough? Excuse me? What's the bottom one? The bottom one is what's existing. Now. Okay. Yeah, so what you have now, it says 12-foot travel lane, 12-foot travel lane. You have about a four to five-foot trail and a five-foot tree well. And um, we think that, and actually the 12-foot travel ways, there's places where it's actually wider because there's certain bends in the road where it kind of flares out. So we think that the road, when you're ready to repair the road, that we could actually reconfigure this a little bit and um, take some of this real estate and really kind of refit this promenade, um, particularly the northern area of the promenade is where it's really tight, as you know. Okay, so we're going to keep going south. Now we're at the North Shore area. And um, we're thinking about um, the continuing sort of with the roadway and, and wondering if we could maybe traffic calm this road and think about parking in a different way, create a continuous bike trail, um, think about sort of activity areas, sort of zones of use, and, and also really use this opportunity to celebrate sort of the, the estuary and seagrass kind of environment that we have here. So we start to think about it in terms of kind of use zones that might kind of guide our thinking a little bit. Um, we know about North Vinoy Park and how heavily that's used for events. This is really sort of a celebration space. We have the area around the Aquatic Center, the, the Kids and Cubs ball field, where it's really a competition area and it's an area that's driving a lot of cars because people are, you know, they're driving to use these facilities in large numbers when there's an event. We have kind of a community kind of play, um, sort of community park kind of setting and then we labeled um, to, the, to the extreme north where the sundial is all the way up here we're saying this is really a relaxation very passive kind of open space is there anything you would add to that kind of characterization before we dive yeah, into it? And, and just that there's a progression from the community to the waterfront as well. So we want to make sure it's easy to get from those neighborhood streets across the drive and to the water's edge as well throughout all of those in a different way. So I think, I think what we're maybe putting on the table um, through the interaction that we've had is a couple of things. Right now, this area is really a very, um, other than the aquatic center, it really is just a very sort of singular green space. Space. And as we look at the use of it and the form of it, we see something that actually um, could be a little more differentiated. So um, we, we think that, that the competition area, there's going to be pressure to intensify this. Um, and over time as these facilities are updated. And so we want that done in a way that honors the park. But we also think that there's a desire on the part of sort of emerging folks in the community that you know, they, wanna, they wanna play, they wanna get out and do volleyball, they wanna play bocce, they wanna do stuff. They wanna have a, a somewhat active area that doesn't compromise the, the surrounding aesthetic of kind of this you know, large passive green space with big open views, right? <coughs> So um, let me come back to that in a second. Um, so, so what we've been thinking about is that there are, there are certain areas of the park where, you know, when you talk about places smell, what this really has to do with is how we're dealing with stormwater and how we're thinking about the relationship of the city, the open space, and the water relative to stormwater and pollutants. And so one little example that we sort of looked at was um, in this area immediately north of where the um, restroom building is, this is actually a large detention swale for stormwater. And the detention swale is um, planted with St. Augustine sod, and it's got a lot of dollar weed growing in it, which usually tells you there's a tremendous amount of water in there. It's soggy a lot of the time. It's next to a parking lot that is fairly untreated, and this you've got, you've got water coming off the parking lot going directly into a sewer line that is either popping out somewhere in the park or it's popping out in the bay. That's generally sort of how the current system works, um, if you sort of walk one end of that park to the other. 
Is everyone familiar with these kind of images, right? So what we are sort of thinking about is that this going forward, this doesn't really represent um, modern sort of leading edge contemporary thinking about natural systems or how to deal with parking lots and, and, and stormwater runoff. Um, we actually think that, um, and these are some parks that, that actually our team has worked on. Uh, Dave and, and Mike and I have been working on this park for, for years. Um, the way that stormwater is thought of now is that you can actually take it and pre-treat it coming right off the parking lot in ways that actually celebrate the juxtaposition between Florida native systems and manicured open space. And you can actually have both, and they're both beautiful, and you can put them next to each other. And if you think carefully about design in terms of standards, um, oftentimes these parks come down to really neat edges and how you deal with the interface between the rough and the refined. And I think we can have that here in a way that can really be um, refreshing and kind of um, contemporary and, and um, um, educational for folks that come to the park. Um, and the path through these kind of areas from sort of a stormwater area into a manicured play space where you might play bocce or frisbee or whatever you want to do, um, the journey through and the interface is actually what makes the parks really dynamic um, and makes them places where you can appreciate the, inter the interplay between the natural environment and the city. So as we looked at this area, we said, okay, well, we've talked about, you know, can we be stewards of the natural environment? Can we think about outfalls? Um, can we think about how we deal with play and what play really means and maybe how we represent art and discovery in the landscape? And we said, well, maybe this is an area that if we thought about this in a different way, we actually could create a very different kind of environment where you're walking across something that has a very different relationship to stormwater, a different, a different thought about what beauty is. And because this would be very proximate to the open play areas, that juxtaposition would create a sense of rhythm and beauty to the overall park. Um, and then we can put things in that kids can discover and we can, we can have educational signage, you know, talking about waves of grass and the waves of grass that are out in the estuary. And we can bring back our garden architecture and, and um, you know, have a very dynamic environment that in addition will allow us to actually consolidate the stormwater in a more condensed area because we're going to go ahead and say stormwater is stormwater. Let's make a natural feature out of it. And by doing that, it can get a hair deeper and get smaller so that the area that is where we really want to play doesn't have to be part of the detention area. We can actually get it high and dry and have those bocce areas and so forth, the frisbee areas, actually be drier areas because we're going to go ahead and let this be a little more wet and a little more natural. Um, I'm going to back up a couple slides and just talk about um, North Boulevard here. We made a few observations about North. It's, it's a fairly, let me walk over here, it's a fairly wide road and you have a whole series of side streets coming in at basically the same angle. And so we started to experiment with, you know, could we actually get a little more parking for the park if we went to an angled parking? Um, could we get bike lanes in? Could we actually tighten up the geometries in certain places to make the crossing shorter? Because the crossings here are actually a lot wider wider because of the way these these curbs kind of flare out the crossings become a lot longer than they really need to be so we want to maybe consider in the plan the possibility that there might be um, a refit of this um, road someday that does tighten it up thinks about parking in a different way and maybe has a traffic calming um, feature to it by doing these roundabouts every other street or maybe every third street as you go down um, in order to just make sure that the that, that cars are not kind of cannonballing down that, down that road so just something to consider. Yeah, I mean, this is not new. If you would drive around, walk around the Northeast District, the gardens all come to the curb. You've done a really great way of sort of asserting yourself on the public realm of the street. Even Beach Boulevard has beautiful bump outs and bulb outs and gardens. That whole garden feel comes to the waterfront, but it seems as if on, Beige, on, on North Shore Drive, you've just forgotten all about those good lessons and it's become this big wide open gash between residential and beautiful gardens and this garden on the bay that we're trying to keep and so there's this sort of let's stop all that good stuff we've been doing in the neighborhoods for some reason and we've just got this bold boulevard so this Im this image talks about creating some of that traffic calming opportunity but it's a way of bringing that garden street out into this into into um, north shore and making that 
progression from the residential neighborhood into the garden, into the garden elements in the park, all the way to the bayshore. And creating this sort of sense of civic, you know. So we see the whole bayshore uh, learning from that northeast neighborhood that has these beautiful roundabouts, this traffic calming, and maybe every second or third street that intersects with bayshore needs to have one of those little devices that slows traffic and brings the garden across and allows pedestrians to really walk and, and access the park. So let me jump ahead here. Um, so continuing on with, with um, sort of where we left off here, um, another area, you know, I, I mentioned, I've mentioned bocce a couple of times and people wanting to get out and do some gaming things. You know, we, we do think this idea of a couple of sort of community park nodes where there's a little bit more service for active recreation. And again, sort of having that be focused in certain locations so that other areas can be very passive and you have sort of have that rhythm to what the experience is. We think that this is a location where there can be some increased level of um, recreational service. And when we do it, we should do it in a way that's beautiful, that has a sense of civic, um, incorporate art and play and discovery and all the things that we've been saying. What we see in the picture is a very utilitarian, it certainly is hurricane proof, um, but it's a very utilitarian structure. We have a very utilitarian um, shower here when you come off the beach. Um, you know, we all know what this place is, right? It's just a very, it's a set of very functional solutions and that's really all they are is functional. And what we, what we would suggest, and it doesn't mean that you would necessarily build it just like this or even design it just like this, but there's there's a lot of cues that we're trying to put in this sketch. One is that we could think about the edge between the paved area stepping down to the beach in a more dynamic sort of interesting way that allows people to engage the beach, watch other people, and just have a more dynamic kind of experience. Um, and I talked about edges earlier. Edges are really, really important to park design. Um, we think that the shower facility, you know, maybe the whole thing of, of water and celebrating wind and movement and everything, that that could be integrated in something much more more artistic and much more interesting. And you wouldn't do this everywhere up and down the beach, but at these kind of nodal locations, we should be thinking of things that are sort of unique and special and interesting. Um, we can either rebuild the restroom building or update it to make it a little more contemporary, a little bit more open, um, a little more breezy. Um, this is a different type of architecture, just to say that we're not stuck on the Granada stuff, um, although you could do that here just as well. Certainly the restroom building at the foot of the pier is a beautiful, highly traditional building. Um, and, and and, and being able to maybe get some very basic services, you know, can you get an ice cream cone? Can you get a, can you get a water or Gatorade? Can you rent um, maybe some play equipment or a kayak? Just very, very light touch kind of stuff to just sort of bring this node, which is already occurring as a node, and kind of bring it into, sur bring it into focus and allow it to provide more service to folks that really want to have an active experience on the beach. Um, so again, sort of talking about kit of parts, sort of design studies, Phil did these just real quick to look at different types of architectures. I don't, so again, we're not sort of locking in that it should be this architecture or that architecture, but that in maybe two or three zones as you go from north to south, um, we could think about a family of fixtures to bring some consistency and sort of elevate the sense of place and sense of design um, going on when you're here in the parks. Well, and, and that there are no big surprises when somebody does do one, that you, you're familiar with it and comfortable with what's going to emerge, yeah, yeah. whether it's a small bench or a larger building. Right, exactly. So let's move downtown. This is the, uh, we, we kind of called this area sort of the Straub Park and Pier District. And the reason is because the more we tried to subdivide the Uplands and Bayshore Boulevard and North Straub and South Straub and Beach Drive, we really, the more we tried to subdivide it in our minds, the more we started to think of it as really sort of one large connected district that we really need to, we need to work harder on how to connect it all, not how to subdivide it in our brains. Um, so I'm going to go very quickly sort of touch on the highlights, then I'm going to let Vaughn kind of walk through some of the details. What you're seeing is sort of a rethinking of what the arrival um, sequence is here on beach and sort of announcing the peer presence all the way up at beach and then completely repositioning the role of these um, Bayshore Boulevard and the roads that lead out to the pier, really repositioning what their role is, rethinking how the slips work, um, and really rethinking about the community park possibilities here at the, at the 
the, um, at the end of the upland and the transition to the pier. So I'm going to let Vaughn, actually, I'll just give you the clicker. It'll be easier for Thanks. you. And I think one of the sort of big concepts that everybody struggled with is how do you get to the pier? And this, in a way, turns, us, turns it around and says, well, we're just going to bring the pier to downtown. So we want to start that pro progression of people walking and people engaging uh, the waterfront and Where's the little light? Oh. Top one, got it. Um, so that we bring water and a beautiful fountain right to beach, and that it's very easy to walk down and see the pedestrian activity that's happening. Right now you see a huge street and roadway. Um, do we have more planned details in this, yeah, or should one I third, go one through? Third, one okay, third. so we'll just get, we'll walk through it in different sections, but you kind of get the general idea of, of it from this. This is where the, the pier project happens and lands at the waterfront at this end. So as you're coming to downtown, uh, as I said, uh, uh, reconfiguring rather than the road barging all the way through, straight through, we want cars to make a concerted decision at this point to either continue on beach, and as we know, uh, the, the waterfront road is very underutilized. We're still going to keep it that way, but it allows us to pave it as a beautiful ceremonial space, so it's a great promenade walking experience f designed for pedestrian firsts, so that when cars drive along it, just like they do on the, the brick streets in the city, you get a sense that you need to be more well, well behaved as a driver because it's really a pedestrian place that we're, we're engaging. So the inbound traffic will travel down the south side very much like it does today, so utilizing all the parking to service the, the boats that are here. We think there's some opportunity to reclaim a little bit of the edge here and create a much better pedestrian walking edge along, uh, along the docks and certainly move the docks away from the edge so they don't have to be secured with a big fence right there. They, they will be accessed for a floating dock uh, so that you have a much more open experience. Um, we think the MFA and, and a beautiful bridge that links that directly across to the History Museum would be a wonderful uh, addition to this waterfront edge, so you could actually shortcut instead of coming through the main drag, you could walk through this beautiful artful bridge and enter the waterfront experience along the south side of the Vinoy Basin, a wonderful restaurant, open all that up, much like the restaurant does on the south side, has great views of the bay and the, and the marina, the same thing should happen on the north side. So really opening it all up and then tidying up the park too that really is the end of the Straub Park system in a more meaningful park rather than what we see there today that is almost too laissez-faire and informal, something that really can be used for great events downtown. Yeah, let me jump on that real quick. When we did our walking audit here, we talked about sort of the, the kind of popcorn tree planting. And I think what we're trying to go for in a lot of these designs is less a sense of everything is the same and more accentuation of sort of mass and void. So whether the mass and void has to do with sod versus wetlands to really accentuate and celebrate the difference. I think in this case, we're talking about, you know, instead of just sort of a, a, a randomly planted forest, you know, let's have an amazing edge that's shaded with this incredible outdoor room in the middle and you perceive it as an outdoor or room. So that's, that's kind of what we want to think about in these kind of big spaces. Right. So we'll just walk through some images of what we've heard and, and how we've resolved some of these issues. A lot of what we heard was even though it's great to have automobiles here, there would be times it would be great not to have the cars there and extend the park to the waterfront. So we think there's an opportunity to claim some space when we reconfigure the road, certainly get rid of all the cars and actually expand the lawn so that you have a, a wider park, something that is really engaging the bay and, and, and connecting you. So certainly getting rid of all of the cars would be an opportunity. Also to bridge across perhaps uh, from the North Vinoy onto the, the main island. So a, a before and after view showing a more pedestrian friendly edge. The cars obviously would still drive by on off-peak hours, but certainly an evening stroll or a weekend experience would be one with a great picnic lawn, extends all the way to the edge with the bikes and maybe even a few overlooks uh, that pop out into the, into the bay. And we think, again, another beautiful artful swing bridge, something that would open to let the yachts through. Um, not everybody gets a garage clicker, but that's kind of how they function. You, when you're approaching your boat and you have a license to come in, you open this drawbridge and, uh, and move into the bay. So a wonderful experience-oriented waterfront. This is the street that we want to tame a little bit and put on a bit of a diet. We think there's certainly no reason to park right at the water's edge here when you can literally walk from one side to the other. So we're going to claim this as pedestrian. We want to create a 
continuous surface all the way across without the edges and the slope and the curbs so that when you have great festivals and walks and art fairs or dinner at the bay, uh, you don't have to worry about the curbs and it's a seamless edge to Stroud Park coming down right the way to the waterfront. We think we can get a permanent bike lane in here. We would allow cars obviously in, one, in each direction and some parking off peak hours, but we want to create a place that when the cars are not there and you celebrate it, it feels like a great civic room for the city and a beautiful uh, manicured edge with uh, perhaps even a wooden deck at the edge and much more that sort of sense of domesticity which we think St. Pete is really good with is you feel like you own the space so some loose furniture and benches and Adirondacks at the waterfront kind of great terrace the great promenade rain garden bike park rain garden the rain garden again stormwater uh, inlet catching the catchment areas here so we get put clean water back in the bay and then right at the edge, a little bit of a detail just to show there are other ways of making it domestic. There's been a, an effort here to, to make that happen, but we think there's a, a stronger design ethic that can really continue all the way to the south. So we're going to extend this idea all the way down to the Dali and, and hopefully take some of the elements of the, the great deck. If you imagine yourself on a ship, imagine this is an extension of a great ship's deck, probably a little wooden edge strip that really gives you a sense of change as you move from the concrete edge, the walking edge, to the relaxing edge so when you step off this you're truly in that relaxed mode with furniture, loose furnishings all the way up and down the bay all the way down to the Dali and again the continuous surface across to Stroud Park. I'm sorry? From the Vinoy to the Dali all the way down so the entire street would be rethought as a great public room. Um, the view that you have currently of the back of the museum, so we think this needs to be addressed so that it really faces the river. It's a very internalized building. We think an opportunity for a great restaurant here would be wonderful, and if they work with a museum to really create a beautiful linkage across, a pedestrian bridge across, that would really complete that link around the Vinoy. So you could walk and stroll uh, around each of the basins, the Vinoy, celebrated with the restaurants at each end and the swing bridge. So the notion of the bridges is kind of a romantic idea to make everything connected, more accessible. So the, the bridge that we just showed you is right here, connected into the new restaurant edge. We want to really make sure that all the edges are taken at full advantage of. So you're seeing edges that are programmed with activities. We think this is an opportunity to, again to consolidate all the parking that is scattered throughout the, the uh, arrival to the pier and really consolidate it in the central area with the two access roads and angle, angle parking and a great piazza that can be used for other events. So if the farmer's market or Saturday market decided they wanted to use the space, it would be set up with the electricals and there would be washrooms and public facilities so that they really too can take advantage of the great view. A public dock that there really isn't right up against the edge. So if you come into the Vinoy, you can have a public dock, a water taxi that would be able to pick people up and drop people off. We think there could be an open air public market building, something that is very lightweight, but it takes to create shade so that there could be some more semi-permanent vent perhaps that are here more full-time that would use this space. A trolley stop so that the trolley can come down and pick people up right at the market and take people back into the city. A place for trucks that they could back in and vendors and farmers could sell their produce underneath this shaded area. We would still provide limited access all the way to the pier but we've shown this as sort of a yellow brick road so that it's really again designed as a pedestrian space first and foremost to get you to the great arrival and then again a celebration piazza again uh, at the end of this grind promenade uh, that brings you into the, the waterfront green. So some of the images that we want to share, this is the existing roadway as you go down into the pier. It's really just four lanes of traffic. It's a very automobile oriented view. There's parking all the way along one side and there's a shared bike and pedestrian pathway on the uh, north side of the road. We think in the same amount of space we can serve the docks, we can put two lanes of traffic that are inbound or outbound I mean to the pier and we can take over the entire central area as a great pedestrian walk 60 feet between the existing plantings, add new plantings, add new shade, make it a truly iconic walk out to the pier. And then the return traffic would be to the uh, north side of this approach. Do you have a plan for bicycles on that road? Yes, I think we would like to have bicycles on the, the roadway or perhaps even on the 
promenade as you go out along the promenade space. So this is really what you have, and I think the idea of bringing the pier into the town is an understanding that we have that this really tells you that the pier is a long, long way away, and you have to drive all the way out to the pier, and it's a very inhospitable walk, and we think we should do something that really reaches and, and pulls that all the way in, so that it truly is a great promenade and passage out. There could be farmers markets and art fairs, a whole lot of celebrations that happen along this space. Uh, you're seeing the bike lane here that we think can happen between a row of palms and the existing trees on both sides so that you can separate the bikeways. A beautiful, perhaps, art, art bench that sort of meanders all the way down and changes shape so it's a truly inviting, enticing place to walk down to the pier. And so once you arrive at the pier, there's a great lawn. Uh, the new pier will be built slightly higher, so we want to take, an adva take advantage of that and create a stepped amphitheater so that we can really take advantage of the views, celebrate the beach, perhaps have some informal events that happen on the beach itself, expand the beach as we, we heard a desire for, and also in introduce a rain garden and water garden on the one side. So there are a lot more choices here rather than just the big flat open lawn that is sort of ubiquitous along the waterfront. There's many more reasons to come down here and celebrate it, and even a concession that might happen at the end of the pier here, serving people on the beach, serving people on the pier. Access for handicapped and special drop-off to the pier uh, so that you can have access to this and to the public dock that we would have on the south side in the central basin. Um, we certainly want to expand the beach, so we think this is, you know, we don't know what the pier is going to look like in its new form, but we also want to start introducing ideas of sort of managing a, a, a kayak route that maybe goes through the pier. It'll be built with a different type of structure, so provide permeability for small boats and small craft that are moving north-south, um, but an expanded beach some concessions, a way to walk under the pier and connect to the other side so that you really have a completely continuous edge all the way around this. Again, kayaks and perhaps kayak rentals or a place to pull up and some sort of uh, attenuation for the waves here that don't block any of the views, um, but really sort of create a, a safer passage for kayaks going from the north to the south. And then a view looking back from this big automobile roadway back out towards uh, the basin would be perhaps one where you saw the kayaks passing underneath the pier itself, the ferry coming into the south side to the sports area, and a, a, a sense of what the, the attenuation for the waves might be with some low uh, Riprap. So I'm going to take a quick sidebar and talk again about this living breakwater idea because I know that that created some um, confusion amongst folks what we were really trying to talk about. Um, the first thing is sort of, you know, why are we talking about, about resiliency at all? And, and, that's, and it's, it simply has to do with the long-term protection of the city, the basins, and, and um, the natural areas along the edge from wave activity, particularly if there's a big storm. But also, um, during you know, your regular calendar year, you can really get some rough chop in here. And, and if you wanted to do this in a smaller craft, it's very difficult to navigate this water for a good percentage of the year because of how the, the wind comes in from the northeast um, and just creates a lot of chop. So there's a couple of, you know, three or four different ways of sort of thinking about this. One is just, you know, to, to do nothing. And I think what the plan needs to say is that, is that in a master plan type of context, if you think about the future of the city, do nothing is really not an option that the plan can recommend. So then you say, okay, well, what engineering techniques are available when you're ready to really sit down and, and um, analyze what the viable alternatives would be. And there are what we call sort of conventional solutions that, you know, deal with seawalls and, um, you know, all the, all the, you know, sort of pros and cons that come with seawalls. And there may very well be locations on here where you need to make a specific alteration where that may be the most efficient, most cost effective, you know, easiest to permit type of solution. I think what, what we're putting on the table is the possibility that, that with the incorporation of sort of very low kind of um, revetment types of structures, there are ways to, to um, address wave action in ways that are more subtle than really large structures like this out in the water or sort of unsightly kind of concrete wall structures that are right there at the edge, you know, right, right at the park, right? 
So what we've been thinking about is this possibility of these very low kind of um, revetment structures that can be planted and create what we call a living breakwater, which really takes the, the, um, the environment of the estuary and the things that are happening underwater and just sort of extends it and uses that sort of model as, as a natural system to break waves before they get to the water, uh, before they get to the wall. Um, we think it's an alternative that could be looked at when you're ready to analyze this. It doesn't mean that this is the only way to do it or that the walls are the only way to do it. We're trying to say that this is something that I think offers some, some um, positive benefits that really should and could be looked at. Um, we think it has less impact on um, tidal flow. We think there's opportunities to integrate ecological concepts with this. We think there's um, really um, effective ways to protect the coastline from storms. Um, and actually create habitat, I think, is what we think we can link. And, and um, there are models for this that other cities, there's several cities in Florida that are actually implementing this concept right now, as, as well as across um, other parts of the country. The, the idea is that the living breakwater is actually part of the natural shoreline system. You're sort of accentuating what the natural shoreline system is already doing um, with something that's engineered and, and will stay in place. Um, so we sort of think about, you know, well, how would you implement this? And, you know, you're, you're analyzing it, you're trying to make the right choice in the right location. You know, how are you going to engineer an intervention to deal with wave action? So we think that you can look at the possibility of um, limited sort of initial moves, like again, around Spa Beach. You know, how would you protect Spa Beach? Well, you could run a big wall out here. Or you could look at these more subtle kind of naturalistic ways of creating an engineered structure that can, that can participate in the natural environment in a way that a wall cannot. That's what we're putting on the table for consideration. Over time, we think that you may or may not choose to do more of these and actually create a way that really is navigable for small craft and, and non-motorized craft, really from lasting all the way up to the coffee pot, which right now you really can't do that because you get out here in, in open water and it's just very difficult to negotiate. But we think it's something that you would, you would experiment with and implement a little bit at a time as you address specific issues um, going along. So this is the graphic that we drew. It was a pretty bold graphic. There's, there's a lot of those breakwaters out there. Um, so you may or may not do all of this, but I think we're trying to propose that it's something that really should seriously be considered. Um, there are a number of pilot projects underway right now in Florida, as I mentioned, and there are projects in other parts of the country and other parts of the world that are taking this approach. It probably seems a little revolutionary, but a long time ago, sinking a ship out in the Caribbean in order to create a coral reef was revolutionary. So um, we think it's, we think when you're ready to do this, this is an alternative to look at. It's not the only solution, um, and we think it's important to have the overall topic of, of resiliency on the table in the plan. So. Um we actually think that um, the South Basin is, is really a very um, different and sort of complementary opportunity to the traditional downtown, Straub Park, the pier, beach. Um, what we start to see down here is, is um, Demons Landing, which is sort of the complement to um, the pier upland. And then we also get into the sort of active uses that you see around um, the Mahaffey, the Ao Lang, we have the market space. So what we see here is the the opportunity to actually reposition um, not only Demons Landing, but also um, how this basin is used as a port of call, possibly for a regional ferry system, um, and how to actually think about building um, an even more kind of dynamic and um, interesting um, cultural area down here, where you already have the museums and you have the rowdies and so forth. We think there's a real opportunity here. So Vaughn, I'm going to let you right, so take it away. The, the white buildings, thank you. The white buildings are existing buildings, so here you have the Al Lang whether it gets modified or modernized over time, that's the current footprint of what the Al Lang is, the Yacht Club, um, 
the existing Mahaffey Theatre, the existing parking garage that serves both the Dali in this location and the Mahaffey. And the rest is really underutilized property, we think. So this is also perhaps a way to answer the question as we move forward, well, how do we pay for all the goody, goodies that we want along the waterfront? We think that all of the city-owned property could be leveraged uh, and really to create a complementary district rather than these sort of plop elements that are plopped along the waterfront here and tie it all together. So here you see the great promenade that continues all the way from uh, the Vinoy down here to the Dali as a great uh, managed street with a beautiful walking surface. A formalized civic space again. This is currently where uh, the Saturday market occupies a space. So we've brought the Saturday market all the way to the waterfront. So it's important to realize that now you actually have a Saturday market that is on the waterfront and you can actually pull your boats up right to this edge and get off at the dock and go to the market. We could even think of having a floating restaurant or something that comes in and serves a Saturday mar morning market. But a really wonderful complement to the downtown. Beach Drive ends at this point and we have a wonderful celebration of that. We have a new front door that is a f sort of formal front door to the sports district. So it's a really sports and entertainment in an urban fashion. This is the existing hotel, Hilton Hotel, that has a surface parking lot. So as these develop, we want to make sure we're adding parking inventory to this district, so every building here could perhaps add more public parking, so they're included in the, the count that we have for the waterfront. We're seeing an addition of some more seating here that really opens up to the bay, so we don't want to enclose this new sporting or mixed-use facility with stadiums all the way around. What's truly unique is that you're on the waterfront. Once you surround the whole thing, you could be anywhere and not be on the waterfront, so it's important, we think, to keep the views open. We've even introduced small streets that might exist uh, that don't exist today through the parking lot. They'll still function as a hotel, but keep that through. Uh, there's no reason why you couldn't let people walk in and around uh, this on an off game day. Uh, similarly, 4th Street that does go through is seen very much as a service and utility back street right now. We think that whole back street could be turned into a kind of a funky sports street where a lot of activities happen, where people are parking in these new buildings when they come to an event at the sports field and, uh, and, and, and really walk back in through a series of wonderful streets that complement that district. Uh, with the Dali, we think there's an opportunity for the Dali, the parking lot behind the Dali, to grow to be a sort of a boutique uh, meeting space, meeting facility for uh, the city. You're never going to do a giant convention center, but there's always demand for lots of meeting space and meeting room space for the unique events that happen here, whether they're cultural events or artistic events, and so a small complementary use. So this entire district starts to sort of function as an, an arts, entertainment, culture, sports district, and as you heard from Pete, we want to bring in all those people who are visiting from Tampa right into the th thick, of it, thick of things so that they don't have to worry about a car. They can walk right to all those events. They can walk to the Dali, walk to Mahaffey, walk to restaurants, walk to a game, uh, and really enliven it. Out at the pier on Demon's Landing, which has currently got parking, as you may recall, all the way to the waterfront. As part of a big idea, we want to always try and move the parking away from the waterfront if we can. We think here yeah, there's a huge opportunity to consolidate all the parking behind these sheds, which serve to protect the, uh, the permanent moored boats in, in, in the central basin, and really consolidate all the parking in one location so you know that by the time you hit the fountain at the end, you need to have parked your car because the rest is a great picnic lawn, a great outdoor uh, performance space, amphitheater, where the outdoor, the outdoor theater happens, and this truly is given back to the people as a great park element that's tied back with promenades on both sides while still having all the parking inventory that we require. Yeah, let me jump on that as well. Uh, there, there are, let me back up a second. How many folks have used frescoes and enjoy it? I mean, I know I have. Now, we have heard loud and clear that we're not going to develop public parkland on the waterfront. In fact, I was having a dream last night that I was arguing with someone who wanted to put single family homes on Spa Beach. I don't know how this stuff gets invented in your dream state, but I, I literally had that dream last night. So I think that when we look at the waterfront and the waterfront parks, um, we've heard you loud, loud and clear, and we, we to a 98% uh, agree that those need to, number one, stay public, and they need to stay in park. We think that with a few small exceptions, 
there are opportunities for retail services that would actually serve the park user, the park experience, and, and make the place a little more dynamic. So we've, we've located those very tactically in some very um, sort of specific locations where they think they, w they would really work. For instance, up here at the gateway of Demons Landing, we have a little red building and a couple of little um, uh, straw market types of things to the south, where we think there could be a little opportunity to sit there kind of like at Fishtails or at, or at Frescoes or, or something like that. We did the same thing um, off the back of the museum building. We showed food and beverage coming off the back of that thing. You know, do you want to have the back of a building with a sheer wall, or would you actually like to sit out there and enjoy the water? You you know, so we think that there are small tactical interventions that can take place. This area, we see a completely different situation. What we see is inboard, isolated, de-urbanized surface parking that is, that is underutilized land. It doesn't really connect to the water or the water's edge, and it has become sort of pork chopped out of the urban fabric. And the fact that there isn't urbanism through that area, there, there is an activity on the ground floor of, of buildings actually is a significant part of what causes your sense of safety and connectivity to fall apart in that area. We also know that the that, that St. Petersburg can support another hotel or two in the in the near arc of time. We've heard a lot of discussion about the need to re-explore um, some kind of conferencing space, um, the opportunity to maybe look for another museum site or two. Um, um, the fact that if, if um, you know, if this sports venue continues to progress, you know, and I'm, I'm a soccer fan, so I certainly hope they do well, but, you know, you think about what kind of retail services, you know, they're just not building these isolated suburban ballparks anymore. Ballparks bring activity to street's edge, and that creates urbanism. So we look at this and we say, well, gosh, you know, this is public land, but, but it's land that really would best serve the city in terms of its use, its urbanism, if it actually became activated with buildings. We're going to show you some sketches in a minute of what that looked like. And we think that making a decision for a hotel or a conferencing facility here is very different from deciding whether or not you're going to put residential out on Spa Beach, right? I mean, it's just, there's just two fundamentally different universes. Now, here's the punchline, and this is something that will be a conversation later on, but I think this is something the community really needs to think about. You have um, language in your city charter now that, that um, significantly um, inhibits anybody from doing any development on a land lease. You have, you have limitations of one year, two year, three years, ten years. I think that what that effectively does is it says we're not going to have anything on the public land because nobody can capitalize a project on something that they're going to get a three year land lease on. So I think that one of the things to think about is if you believe any of these ideas are valid, and you may not believe all of them, but if there are a couple that you believe are valid, I think one of the points of inflection when you're, when you're ready to make a decision is, you know, are you ready to do a significant long-term land lease for this type of um, use? You did a 99-year land lease for the Dalley, and you may, there may come a point where you want to make that kind of decision again as a community. And, and, where we, and where we talk about, you know, this could create revenue, um, we're not doing this because we want to create revenue. We're doing it because we think it's the right thing for the growth of the city. But there is a great side benefit. It's publicly owned land. And, and if this property in here became a development opportunity, that does create revenue. And there are mechanisms to funnel revenue back into other improvements that you want to see on your waterfront. And as you can tell, we've created an opportunities for a lot of improvements. So there is a linkage there, and it's worth talking about. But it's not the sole reason why we're looking at this in this location. Um, Demon's Landing, we talked about a little bit, uh, the outdoor access to the waterfront. Uh, in detail, again, we've been through this before, but great opportunities to develop and streets that continue. The most important thing with access is that streets continue and they lead you somewhere, so we think we've accomplished that. We have a pretty austere front door to what could be a really great place that is great when the farmer's market's there, but we want to make it great all the time. So we think as a great civic space, it can accommodate parking on off-peak days, but it's a great ce celebration for the arrival to the Al Lang, for events, for the market itself, and it's even great when it's maybe an empty space. Um, 
the existing service street that happens behind the, the Mahaffey. We want to certainly keep the access and circulation, the capacity for the vehicles, but we want to make it into kind of a front door entry to from the parking. So when you leave the parking structure and you walk down these great streets into the, recon, the, the new multi-purpose space, it's a great place to be where there could be vendors and stuff being sold on game day, etc., etc., and really complement the area. We talked about walking down 4th Street and getting to the waterfront. We think this is where the ferry comes in and brings all those rowdy folks to the games and, and keeps them off the other streets, but brings them right into the city, into the heart of the action, and a place where, and quite frankly, you could do the reverse and get the boat from here and take the ferry, go into the Tampa, go to a, a game on the other, other side as well. All right, we're going to quickly move. Go ahead. You want to jump in? Yep, so going. we think another huge game changer for the city is this window of opportunity on Baybara Harbor. Today it's kind of a sleepy hollow. Uh, this is the university campus. This is the press building. These are some of the research facilities. Again, all the white buildings exist. This is the port building, the edge of the airport, and the Coast Guard on this side. Coast Guard again on the southern side, uh, and the Salt Creek, which we think is just an incredible gem, uh, working hard along the waterfront. So we want to keep this and make this into a strategic partnership between all these people who have a great stake in the community. The opportunity now is to work together and really pioneer something new that we think could be a huge attraction for the region as well. So an authentic working waterfront with science, research, technology, exhibits perhaps, um, and a wonderful place to kind of go and discover the new opportunities for the waterfront. We'll walk through it quickly. So we're going to go through this. We'll take you down First Street. We talked about First Street getting to the waterfront. We'll look at Pointer Park, which we want to clear out and make it a wonderful waterfront experience. Believe it or not, behind this wall is the bay and incredible view. So we certainly don't want these types of closed off buildings right on the waterfront. We think we want to have the buildings on the other side of the street taking advantage of the view of the park and the waterfront. So the gateway to the bay, this is actually the end of First Street. We sense, well, want to create a sense of celebration and arrival again, celebrate the place, and most importantly, get the cars off the waterfront so that you have views out to the harbor and the boats and make it an inviting place for people to enter this campus, which it truly is. It's a campus of a university, a campus of research, uh, and the, the bay itself. The park itself that we're in, we're right here in the old Dali building, which we think we could uh, move and use the meeting space and, and build new buildings with the, the university across the street. Uh, and this would be a great park that really then ties all the local streets through, bring more streets through so that you can really walk from the neighborhoods out to the waterfront. And much like we use the Straub Park, celebrate the edge with a park and a garden experience uh, rather than occupying it with buildings. So taking buildings away to bring the view back to the city. Um, the parking issue along the, the edges, this is very much what it's like today. It's a hard place to be. So bringing the cars, taking the cars back a little bit, finding parking solutions for them that are incorporated into structures and in other parts of the campus, but opening it up again. So this is an inviting place to go and see the authenticity of a working harbor, a working waterfront, which most people find incredibly fascinating when they get there. Uh, looking back towards the airport in the background, the research vessels that are here already, uh, boats that come in right behind us is the Port Authority building. This is the access way back into the city. We think this basin, or at least half of the basin here, is a huge opportunity to create something that's truly iconic, a great port building, the Port Discovery we've heard about, uh, as a wonderful iconic experience along the waterfront. It's something you can't do anywhere else on your waterfront because we respect the parkland at the water's edge. This is exactly the opposite. And again, a huge engine to offer great choice, great variety to do something really different, really unique, and truly authentic uh, for the St. Petersburg waterfront. You're going to talk about uh -oh. Salt Creek. Did we drop uh, no, something click, out of this? Click, click that again. There oh. you go. So, and then looking across from Pointer Park, perhaps on the other side, so this is Salt Creek. The entry to Salt Creek perhaps is another opportunity for a bridge here, uh, but to get across to the other side, and we think this is a huge opportunity to work with the, the tenants on that side, the Coast Guard that occupies both sides, that we can open up some of that waterfront as a public edge and gain public access, bringing the tour ships, we're calling this the tour ships wharf area, but the wonderful industrial type of 
buildings that could be a little bit more rough and tumble and rough on the edges, but including uh, the, the working harbor, the working waterfront, mi mixing it with art and innovation, uh, but truly an opportunity to take a water taxi across from Point to Park out to that great wharf and celebrate the new buildings and new dynamic. This is the existing edge, so again, we want to solve all the waterfront issues of letting water straight into the bay, but this is where we think we could have an opportunity to work with develop development on the uh, one side and the other side to link it across with a great uh, opportunity for a pedestrian bridge that takes you across to this little bit of a sort of funky district that could emerge on the south side of Baybara Harbor. So okay. we'll just click through these. We were going to take a little sidebar here. Mac Nichols um, is an economist with our team, and we've just showed a number of sort of museum ideas, an, av an aviation museum, a discovery um, discovery center. And I think the point here is to, is to understand your position for people who are true lovers of a cultural thing versus people that are enthusiasts and they want to bring their kids um, on a more every once in a while kind of basis. And then people who are looking for just sort of the social, you know, opportunity of going down to the Dolly and having a glass of wine and, and, and just sort of the social aspect of it. So I think the punchline here is that we're going to look at the museum opportunities in a little more detail. And we think that there are some really, really strong underlying characteristics to the region and to St. Petersburg specifically in terms of the number of people. They're here to be on vacation. They're looking for something to do. We know we're in competition with the beach, but we think we can offer something that um, is really different from the beach and, and would draw people, more people, to come over here, particularly if the activities are clustered in a way that, that the museums, this amazing open space opportunity and ability to touch the water, if all of that is more proximate, more connected, more clustered, um, we think this can be a, a really attractive location for for folks to um, visit. <clears throat> so moving a little bit further south towards the, this is the south edge of Salt Creek. Um, Salt, Salt Creek here, coming into the south edge of Baybara Harbor. This is a very long-term proposal that we're going to implement in stages, working in conjunction with all the land users here, especially the, uh, the Coast Guard that's here today. But the first opportunity that we see available is to perhaps create a wonderful jogging and bike trail, and just like you say, eyes on the street, having windows on the street and activities on the street. We want activities on this edge to deal with some of the safety and security issues, but also open up these incredibly dynamic views that they are that are available uh, once you're out on this edge. So we want to create a continuous bikeway that goes through the neighborhood, continuous bikeway jogging trail that brings you out to the working wharf and along the working wharf up into Salt Creek. So you now have a real dynamic connection from Lassing Park all the way up into the coffee pot and take advantage of this uh, truly beautiful place that's out here. Uh, there are some small things that we can do. There's a, there's a bike connection that would be wonderful to facilitate that the community's already worked hard hard on to get bicycles and pedestrians into the system. And we know this will take time, but we certainly believe that the first phase of getting this public edge here is something that's very doable to make it a connection. We think there's an opportunity, too, to take the trail system on the, uh, uh, the top side here, the west side of Salt Creek, all the way to Bartlett Park so that you can really jog and walk and ride a bike from Bartlett Park and all those wonderful neighborhoods out into Salt Creek and, and into the Baybara Harbor itself. So we're getting back into um, that sort of light touch kind of area, which is really where we started the presentation at the coffee pot. And what I would share with you here is when we did our neighborhood walking audit, I think what I was sort of was sort of I came away with was that this park is really all about the edges, um, the street edge, and and can you get into the park? Do we have a do we have a pathway? Is it is it ADA accessible? Is there any shade by the bench? Um, and then getting down to the water, you realize that this structure is in that location because there used to be land there. And so, and so when we think about the edge of the water, when we have an unprotected edge like this with, with stormwater pipes you know, popping out of the soil, we really have an environmentally unsound condition. So, so what we are thinking about is ways of just 
um, enhancing the edge, enhancing access into the park, keeping it as a fairly passive green space, maybe with a few limited amenities. Um, there has been discussion about a restroom facility down there. Um, but also really thinking about in certain locations how to be better stewards of the edge and create um, something that is more stable, more sustainable with specific locations where you can come out with a kayak and access the water. Vaughn was kayaking this this week. Um, you know, it's, it is an amazing experience out here, but it's an experience that is rapidly eroding. Um, and we know that there's, you know, smells and outfall pipes and all sorts of things going on. And I think there's actually a limited amount of time to take control of this and restore a natural system that is sustainable. If we let it go a whole lot more, then you're going to be into, okay, we're going to have to plant walls in order to secure the edge. And we'd like to see it not um, end up at that place. Um, the last sort of thought about Lassing Park and Old Southeast is just how to, how to get to it. And Vaughn talked about a long-term idea to get around the Coast Guard facility, around um, the um, Army Reserve. There's an immediate opportunity, which is on 3rd. And this is, you know, this is Thrill Hill here. This is Salt Creek. And you can see the amount of land that we have here between the right-of-way line and the curb line. And we think it will be a relatively simple um, order to come in and create a multi-use trail within the space available accentuate an overlook here, maybe have a little bit of education, create some branding to the trail. We talked the other night about we, we need a parks uh, trail system that when you get on the trail system, you know that you're part of the park system and you're headed to the destination that you want to get to, even if you're going through some of these kind of transitional industrial areas, which are important to the city. It's important to have industry. But we also want folks to know that when they're on the trail, they're headed to the downtown, they're headed to the waterfront. <coughs> And so we are looking at this again, we're, we're continuing to work on what the overall system of connectivity and use um, is for the overall master plan. So the next steps, and we'll open it up for some discussion, is you know we're going to continue to do plan refinement and technical review of some of the things that we've um, started to explore. We are working now on developing um, our implementation strategy using all those tools and techniques that I mentioned earlier. Um, we will be documenting the plan um, later this spring, and we will be coming back to you with community presentations of the draft plan once it's packaged and refined and, and scrubbed.